The following is a DW Ancient Egypt production. The following pyramids demonstrate what was to become the norm for the layout of a pyramid complex. Archaeologist Peter Clayton best describes this in his book Chronicle the Pharaohs. This consisted of the pyramid itself, with an entrance on the north face which gives access via a descending passage to a burial chamber normally located in the bedrock or at ground surface within the mass. There can be more than one chamber and at different levels within this group. On the east face of the pyramid is a small pyramid or mortuary temple. From this, a causeway runs down to the edge of the cultivation where the valley temple is located. Very fine reliefs are usually a feature of later examples of these buildings. The early pyramids were built differently from the later ones. During the Old Kingdom, these constructs were made of stone blocks, while those of the later Middle Kingdom were made of mud brick cased in limestone. As a result, the Middle Kingdom pyramids were smaller and did not last. The early structures usually had a core of local limestone cased in an outer layer of better quality limestone or occasionally granite. Granite was also traditionally used for the royal chambers inside the pyramid. Up to 2.5 million limestone blocks and 50,000 granite blocks might be used to construct a single pyramid. The average weight might be anything up to 2.5 tons per block, with some very large megaliths weighing up to 200 tons. The capstone at the top of the structure usually consisted of basalt or granite, and if plated with gold, silver, or electrum, which is a mixture of both, would temporarily blind observers with its reflection in the sun. Based upon the excavation of a series of workers' cemeteries discovered during the early 1990s, archaeologists now believe the pyramids were built by tens of thousands of salaried workers and craftsmen who were lodged in huge encampments nearby. Today, the pyramids stand isolated in the desert, abandoned when the last tourist leaves, but in ancient times, that was not the case. The mortuary complexes were meant to provide the dead with offerings and eternal reverence. In reality, that ideal was never realized, and cults ceased typically after a couple of generations. In the beginning, however, these temples needed personnel to perform the religious tasks. Priests were assigned to those duties and shifts and had to move into the complex. They set up residences near or inside mortuary and valley temples and built themselves shelters. Their presence and natural decay caused damage to the temple architecture, which they tried to patch up with wooden beams and bricks. Over time, these buildings became dilapidated, and the stately monuments we may imagine became a part of small villages, and these temples housed people who cooked, washed, discarded rubbish, and so on, creating a sort of homeless camp. It was impossible for Egyptians in later periods to maintain all the Old Kingdom monuments, and most of them were deserted. Some had a special appeal, however, and remained important. Djoser's complex at Saqqara was a pilgrimage site from the New Kingdom on, with many visitors leaving offerings, especially to his architect Imhotep. On the plateau around it, people from the Middle Kingdom into the Roman period built tombs, and from the New Kingdom on, the mummified Apis bull was buried there. Ramesses II started underground galleries for the animal's burial, which continued to expand into the Roman period. In 1871, French Egyptologist Auguste Mariette discovered some of the great masterpieces of Egyptian art. Near the Pyramid of Meydoum, in the tomb of Prince Nefermaat, known as Mastaba 16, three pairs of realistic and beautifully painted geese on a frieze were found. 
Prince Nefermat was one of several relatives of Pharaoh Snefru who were buried in Maidun. The tomb is known for the special technique used for drawing the scenes. Sculptures carved deeply incised images that then were filled with colored paste. This method was labor intensive because the paste tended to dry, crack, and then fall out. The technique results in vividly colored scenes. This tomb is the only one known to date showing this technique. The fact that later the plaster cracked and resulted in the loss of the paste likely led to craftsmen abandoning this type of decoration. Along with him was Prince Rehotep and his wife Nofret, who were buried with two companion statues. These works of art may be the most extraordinary ever found and are in an excellent state of preservation. This was due to the fact that the chapels in the Mastaba were sealed off in ancient times and apparently never known until modern discovery. The colors appear almost freshly painted. They are each just over 120 centimeters high. The most outstanding feature is that they both retain their lifelike inlaid eyes of crystal which stunned the Egyptian workmen who first opened the tomb. In the torchlight of the dark tomb, they looked alive and the workmen fled in terror. The craftsmanship involved in creating these works of art still remain a mystery to scholars. <laughs>